uh, let's get started. So um, I want to talk kind of about thinking about science as kind of the ultimate public good and really the sort of mechanism designed for si adjudicating science is, is one uh, that is peer review, where we kind of use that as a primary mechanism today for both doing the sort of ex ante review of determining which uh, proposals are likely to be impactful, as well as the sort of ex post review on manuscripts to determine which manuscripts are actually um, impactful. And so I think there is um, a lot of questions around whether this is the, the single most effective mechanism for us to allocate both capital and attention in research today. And so uh, I kind of want to go through both a little bit of the history of peer review. I think uh, Evan at Protocol Labs often has this uh, framework of uh, Chesterton's fence of trying to understand the sort of reason behind a fence before we take it down, and I know there are a lot, lot who want to reform peer review, and then kind of go into, uh, so go into the history first of peer review before thinking about some of the challenges and experiments around reforming it, and perhaps uh, some ideas for how maybe impact certificates might be an interesting primitive for tracking reviews and reforming review. Um, and so this slide is actually uh, from a recent talk by Carl Bergstrom, who's a, a really great meta scientist. I actually encourage you guys to check out his talk from, from last month, and I've included a little link there below. Um, but kind of going to the origins of peer review, there's sort of this canonical story about the first journal, um, uh, the Royal Society of Philosophical Transactions from 1665 with this editor, uh, Henry Oldenburg. And people often point to that being kind of the origin story of peer review, where he was sending out reports to his uh, sort of scientific fellows to get opinions on some of the submissions they were getting, and this being kind of the origins of peer review. And actually, uh, the, the historian that um, Eugene had mentioned that I sort of uh, wanted to attribute sort of an a impact certificate to has done a good job questioning whether this is actually um, a, a true origin story of peer review, given the sort of very ad hoc nature of how they were doing it. And, and in fact, the term peer review is actually not one that didn't that didn't really emerge in the lexicon until the 1970s. It was a very niche thing. And so I kind of want to push back on the notion that uh, science has, review, has uh, relied on peer review as this like uh, mechanism for adjudicating how projects worked for, for a long time. In fact, um, uh, very famously, Einstein, when he was submitting to papers, uh, ha ha generally did not go through peer review. He himself actually had a very uh, upset letter when he was reviewed in the physical review uh, on this paper on gravitational waves in 1936, where the the reviewer had sent me several comments back, and he had sent this letter back to the editor saying, you know, I see no reason to address this, uh, you know, in any case, erroneous comments of your anonymous expert. On the basis of in this incident, I prefer to publish the paper elsewhere. And he would never publish in physical review again. So, you know, uh, the in the 1930s, definitely peer review is not, not the sort of standardized uh, mechanism that we see today. Uh, another sort of case study that, that's kind of funny is the Watson Crick, Crick Nature paper, which also was accepted without any sort of peer review. The editor, uh, John Maddox at Nature at the time, said it was just self-evident that it was correct. And if they had sent it out to any referees, they would have blabbed, and, and that would have sort of uh, compromised the, the sort of sanctity and sec secrecy of the paper being submitted. And, and instead, he never even knew use real peer review at the time, he preferred to carry a bundle of manuscripts with him in the pocket of his greatcoat and pass them around among his chums taking coffee. So really this sort of like formalized structured system of peer review is, is, is very much a modern one. Um, if, uh, and it begins to change really around the 1970s where the government begins demanding more accountability, both on the grant review side where um, the NSF had been funding various social science projects that various politicians had qualms about. And so there was a question around who was actually uh, you know, rubber stamping these projects. Were they politically motivated or do we have unbiased expert reviewers providing a layer of sort of accountability? Um, and then also trying to understand what were the outputs that were coming out of this funding? Were those outputs actually valid? And so this is sort of the inflection point where peer review starts becoming um, sort of established as the dominant mechanism for how, how we adjudicate science. Uh, and if you want to learn more, I, as I mentioned, Lyndon Baldwin has, has written both a fantastic book on sort of the history of nature, um, as well as the sort of rise of peer review kind of in, in Cold War America. So I encourage you guys to take, take a closer look at that. Um, but sort of moving forward, I think uh, the question is sort of, what are the challenges with peer review today? And in many ways, it's this uh, a, a true public good where scientists kind of donate their time. There was a recent paper last year where it was estimated that uh, there was sort of a, a billion dollar altruistic donation based on the sort of hundred uh, over a hundred million hour hours that were that uh, donated by scientists as just sort of this duty to just journals on the manuscript review alone. And so there's a question of how do we actually reward and recognize the reviewers for doing that work? Um, 
part of the question is sort of what motivates these scientists to, to do all this unpaid labor for these journals. Uh, and this, this was a fantastic survey done uh, just a few years ago uh, by a company, Publons, that was working on sort of doing uh, reviewer recognition uh, for, for peer review. And they surveyed about 12,000 researchers. Uh, a large majority felt that there was just this sort of intrinsic duty as part of their job as a researcher do, to do it, even though there are sort of pretty, pretty weak uh, incentives and recognition and, and rewards for doing it. And so there's um, sort of a question of how, how do we actually find ways, especially as editors and uh, sort of grant committees struggle more and more to find qualified reviewers to do this labor of reviewing, how do we actually motivate them? And so I thought the survey was at least an interesting one to get a good sense of what motivates uh, the reviewers today. Um, there's also questions around how effective this, uh, how effective peer review actually works. There's some some in interesting sort of case studies, at least, showing that peer review has sort of been a, a gatekeeper of a lot of innovative research. This was, uh, you know, a piece from from almost 30 years ago, kind of going through lots of different case studies, whether it's the discovery of V lymphocytes or the Krebs cycle, um, or even the the, the famous uh, Kate Faney's Al Altamira, where uh, peer reviewers have been traditionally a very sort of adversarial um, process of uh, rejecting sort of high risk, high reward, uh, high impact research. And so how, how, how do we think about, again, mechanisms per perhaps to align reviewers more with uh, wanting to select projects that are actually sort of prescient in, in nature? Um, there's also this, this uh, fantastic tweet that came out, I think, uh, about a year and a half ago from one of the top uh, researchers that was studying um, spike protein design for, for sort of uh, for the vaccines. And he had previously been working on the MERS spike protein and had a huge amount of trouble getting this published, uh, these two particular proline substitutions in the spike protein, and uh, sort of tweeted the, this kind of tongue-in-cheek uh, remark that after s over a year of trying to get this thing published in top journals, uh, he was pleased at least that it came out in the form of the vaccines at the end. So there's this question of, again, how do we do this reviewer alignment? How do we actually recruit reviewers who are um, uh, excited about and, and um, not, not necessarily just adversarial in terms of what sort of projects they're picking, either for publication or, or for funding? Um, there's also a question of how much peer review works as a feedback mechanism for actually improving the kinds of papers that are being submitted. This was, a, I think, a really interesting study during the pandemic where uh, the large majority of COVID researchers were using preprint submissions to submit uh, and share their results directly without having to go through sort of this filter of peer review and comparing the uh, sort of publications after they had been reviewed and accepted in the journals with the original preprints. And again, large majority of them uh, are not really changing the figures at all. Generally, the conclusions or other um, text I is being pretty minimally sh uh, changed. So if, if one of the major jobs of peer review traditionally has been to be a sort of feedback mechanism for, for, for scientists to uh, help uh, correct potentially um, flawed experiments or methodology it does not seem really in this age of sort of peer-to-peer um, -peer feedback that perhaps this um, formalized uh, gatekeeping journal, journal uh, mechanism is, is necessary. Um, there's also a question of how effective the rant reviewers are for grants. And this is a study a few years ago looking at the sort of NIH peer review percentile scores. And essentially, the, the takeaway from, from the paper is that they're pretty good at picking out the, the, the very worst proposals. Usually, the, the bottom 20th percentile correlates well with sort of various uh, measures of researcher uh, productivity and output. But beyond that, it is essentially picking at random. And so th that's, that's led various folks to suggest either lottery-based mechanisms for picking um, proposals p after a certain sort of quality threshold or uh, other, other things that are less burdensome given the sort of uh, amount of time that researchers are spending on grant writing as well as on grant review today. Um, there's also a question of whether reviewers actually uh, agree on, on grants, which I, I don't know if that's necessarily a good thing. I, people have talked a lot about whether high variance uh, grant making might actually lead to superior outcomes, but it does mean that when we have a very small number of reviewers often on these standing sections, uh, it, it may be highly contingent on who ends up being placed on your panel in terms of whether you get a grant uh, accepted or not. And so uh, in that case, sort of the, the uh, low degree of inter-reviewer um, agreement I is something that, that should uh, give rise to concern. Um, and so the question is now that we have so many open uh, uh, feedback and curation mechanisms, uh, how do we think about sort of informal peer review as per perhaps a new venue for accomplishing some of the goals of the, the highly structured 
uh, academic peer review system. Uh, this is a case study that I actually quite like where uh, after uh, Thomas Piketty's Capital had come out, there was an in interesting uh, sort of uh, blog post on uh, Tyler Cowen's economics blog, Marginal Revolution, where this uh, grad student at the time found uh, s that Piketty had kind of made uh, uh, an error in terms of how he had calculated depreciation. And uh, that sort of uh, comment on this random blog as sort of an open peer review blew up so much that the grad student was later invited to submit uh, a paper to the Brookings Institution and really got, got quite a bit of a claim from the, the, the review that he made. And so in some ways, peer review, open peer review can be a mechanism for, for building reputation, especially for younger scientists who have not established themselves yet. And so I think that, that points to a, a potential interesting case for uh, one of the benefits of allowing open review that actually confers reputational benefits to the reviewer. Um, there's also been a uh, sort of uh, a, a lot of interesting um, peer review of biomedical images on a platform called PubPeer, uh, where th there are various researchers, most notably um, Elizabeth Bick, who have spent a lot of time kind of going through looking at images, picking out possible fraudulent um, data, which is again something that reviewers tend not to spend spend a lot of time, which shows that there is room for sort of not only just po post publication um, peer review, but also uh, again, the, the power of kind of openly let, letting people comment. And actually, in these cases, bo both of these figures were uh, from papers that were kind of seminal to these biotech stocks that later, uh, after kind of having this revelation of um, fra fraudulent data, ha had massive sort of swings. And so um, earlier, there was sort of a, 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 a workshop upstairs around market mechanisms for, for science. And there's a question around, what does shorting bad science look like? And in some ways, we have uh, at least some, some interesting case studies in the small cap biotech uh, public markets today to show how we might be able to incentivize uh, different uh, reviewers to go out and look for fraudulent data. And whether th these sort of skin in the game financial mechanisms distort science is, I think, an interesting kind of experiment to run. Uh, but at the very least, it creates um, uh, an open feedback loop for people to kind of, again, comment on, on uh, research that, that might not be of sufficient quality or caliber. Um, so now I'm going to just go quickly through uh, so some new review mechanisms. I think there's a lot of ex interesting experimentation, especially in, in sort of the AI community right now with open review. Um, there, there's a fantastic researcher at, uh, at Carnegie Mellon, Nihar Shah, who's done a good job sort of summarizing the different mechanism design uh, experiments that the, these um, uh, various AI research communities have done in terms of how papers get bidded on, in terms of how reviewers get selected, how you ensure that there aren't sort of collusion and conflict of interest rings. So I won't dive too much into it, but I would suggest anyone who's interested in exploring that literature to take a look at Nihar's work. Um, there is also a lot of interest in using sort of replication and prediction markets um, to kind of estimate the uh, reproducibility of scientific research a priori. And, and there's data that shows that at least some of the work that does not replicate well can be pretty quickly picked up by these generalist kind of prediction market participants, uh, especially in the social sciences. Uh, DARPA has also put out some competitions and actually funded s some fairly large um, markets to see if there's actually predictability in terms of uh, identifying non-replicable studies. Um, there's also a pretty interesting project uh, early in the COVID-19 preprint sort of deluge of whether uh, prediction markets would help uh, adjudicate which uh, preprints would actually end up uh, being being published. And so I think there there's a, a kind of a wealth of possible sort of mechanism design space to explore around new ways to, to uh, elicit more accurate reviews, whether that's uh, on re replicability or on sort of fraud, as I mentioned earlier. Um, I think one of the other really interesting mechanisms that, that I'm pretty uh, curious about is sort of peer to peer reviews. So, this was um, actually uh, a project um, that came out of, uh, I, I believe, these uh, astronomy communities where booking telescope time was something that was highly finite. And so, how do you actually evaluate which proposals should, should, uh, be selected, and as they were getting more and more um, projects, they decided we should actually get the submitters of these projects, these researchers themselves, to come together and try to adjudicate which um, projects should get um, telescope time. And so uh, kind of based on that pilot, uh, the NSF actually ran this sort of distributed peer review project where each submitter of a grant would also take on the burden of reviewing things. And I think that's kind of an in interesting mechanism of sort of peer-to-peer -peer, uh, science that, again, might, might be an interesting mechanism to explore. Um, 
the there's also been a lot of interest recently in sort of using scouts and science angels, which uh, David over here has also uh, pioneered at Experiment Foundation, as well as some other organizations of trying to empower scientists themselves to uh, rather be, be sort of uh, inbound reviewers, be outbound curators of projects, and and that that may reduce the burden both on the uh, applicants for these different different grants, but also uh, reduce the burden on the reviewers themselves when they already have their sort of existing scientific networks. So uh, I think there's, a lot, uh, again, a lot of interesting uh, design space. And I kind of uh, want to highlight one last one, which is kind of this notion of certificates of impact, which a lot of folks have been talking about. Actually, in the science space, there have been uh, attempts to do sort of reviewer certificates. Elsevier uh, has been working on it for a few years. Publons, as another sort of review technology platform, has also been working on sort of this notion of reviewer certificates. But in this case, because most of these reviews are um, closed and blinded, it's mostly a way of letting the reviewers know, uh, or letting reviewers signal that they've been completing the res these reviews. It's not really a, a sort of a, an incentive alignment mechanism. And so I, I think it's worth thinking about, you know, um, what are ways to kind of improve upon those very rudimentary certificates of just sort of I've completed review to something where the reviewers actually have sort of hopefully long-term um, incentives to leave prescient reviews. And I think there, there are a few sort of considerations. I think one is around this trade-off between privacy and transparency. There's always been uh, this argument that peer reviews should be this sort of blinded, closed process to elicit the most um, accurate reviews such that there aren't sort of adversarial conflicts between the reviewer and the researcher. And I think uh, there are crypto economic primitives that are starting to give us interesting um, tools to play around with both reputation and identity, where perhaps we can still accrue reputation in a way that, that is privacy uh, preserving, whether they're sort of time bound uh, pseudonyms or sort of uh, pseudonyms that are locked away in some sort of zero knowledge um, proof me methodology. I think there's also a question of how do you actually trust which reviews in an open review system are are reliable? And in terms of sort of short term reliability, I think there's um, a, a lot of interesting experiments going on in sort of web of trust systems in terms of building a social graph on top of a knowledge graph in terms of what sort of uh, reviewers you actually uh, ha have uh, existing trust in for curating and reviewing the research that you're evaluating. Uh, and then there's also been a lot of talk around verified credentials and soul bound tokens is another sort of uh, mechanism to quickly assess the short term reliability of reviews. But I think really what we want to move to is this um, system where we're doing long, long term evaluations of the prescience of reviews. And I think a lot of the sort of retroactive mechanisms that people have been discussing here, whether they're bounties or prizes, can also be applied to look at reviews where, uh, you know, uh, in the sort of uh, startup and venture capital ecosystem, they have these sort of portfolio reviews where they have looked at anti-portfolios of companies uh, they, they have missed. And I think there should also be sort of retrospective analyses of false negative reviews that are happening in science. And we should also consider having sort of prizes and bounties for the best reviewers in science as uh, a key stakeholder in terms of how attention and funding gets allocated uh, in the overall research ecosystem. So um, I think to kind of piggyback on a lot of the uh, discussion and ideation around uh, impact certificates this weekend, I think there's perhaps uh, some new primitives to introduce to the peer review space. And I think I've run out of time, and there's a lot of slides there, but hopefully um, there's so, some, uh, some interesting content to kind of grapple with and, and think about peer review as, as a public good there. Thanks.